May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name and the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Are we ready? We who live in the shelter of Elyon spend our nights in the shadow of Shaddai, who say to Adonai, our refuge, our fortress, our God, in whom we trust. He will rescue us from the trap of the hunter, from the plague of calamities. He will cover us with his pinions, and under his wings we will find refuge. His truth is a shield and protection. We will not fear the terrors of night or the arrow that flies by day or the plague that roams in the dark or the scourge that wreaks havoc at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it won't come near us. Only keep our eyes open and we will see how the wicked are punished. For we have made Adonai the Most High, who is our refuge, our dwelling place. No disaster will happen to us. No calamity will come near our tent. For he will order his angels to care for us and guard us wherever we go. They will carry us in their hands so that we won't trip on a stone. And we will tread down lions, snakes, young lions, and serpents we will trample underfoot. Because he loves me, I will rescue him because he knows my name. I will protect him. He will call on me and I will answer him and I will be with him when he is in trouble. I will extricate him and bring him honor. I will satisfy him with long life and show him my <clears throat> salvation. Stand before the Lord as we uh, continue to read from Deuteronomy chapter 12, 1 through 7, and then Jeremiah 23, 23, 24, Philippians chapter 3, verse 14. Here are the laws and rulings you are to observe and obey in the land of Adonai, the God of your ancestors has given you to possess as long as you live on the earth, you must destroy all the places where the nations you are disposing serve their gods, whether on high mountains, on hills, or under some leafy tree. Break down their altars, smash their standing stones to pieces, burn up their sacred poles completely, and cut down the carved images of their gods. Exterminate their name from that place. But you are not to treat Adonai your God this way. <clears throat> Rather, you are to come to the place where Adonai, your God, will put his name. He will choose it from all your tribes, and you will seek out that place, which is where he will live, and go there. You will bring there your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tents that you set aside for Adonai, the offerings that you give, the offerings that you have vowed, your voluntary offerings, the firstborn of your cattle and sheep, and there you will eat in the presence of Adonai, your God. Let me just say that again. And there you will eat in the presence of Adonai your God, and you will rejoice over everything you set out to do, you and your household, in which Adonai your God has blessed you. Ham Kamot Asher Abdu Asham Hagoyim Asher Aten Yorishim Otam Et Elohim Al Hecherim Haramim Baal Hagba Ot Vetachtal Kel Etz Ranan Vinisatem Et Mizbihotam Vishibatem Et Matseboat Ve Asherehem Tisirfun Baesh Uf Sile Olehem Tigade Un Viabtem Et Eshma min hamakom hahu loto asun ken ya Yahova lo hekem ki im el hamakom ashe yib kar Yahova lo hekem mikal ship te kem la sum et shimo sham li shik no tershu ubat shama vahabe te shama olo te kem vizib hekem ve et masro te kem ve et rumat yed kem ve nid rekem ve nid bote kem Ub korot bekarme metzon nekem, val kal tem sham lefne yahova lo hayak usmach tem bekol mishlach yedkem ate abetekem ashe berakak yahova lo hayak. Jeremiah chapter 23, 23 and 24. Am I God only when near? Ask Adonai, and not when far away. Can anyone hide in a place so secret that I won't see him? Ask Adonai. Adonai says, Do I not fill heaven and earth? Ha Elohe Mikarob Ani Num Yahova Velo Olohe Elohe Merahok Im Yisater Ish Bamistarim Vani Lo Er Enu 
נום יחובה חלו את השמיים ואת הארץ אני מלא נום יחובה. And Philippians chapter 3, 14, I keep pursuing the goal in order to win the prize offered by God's upward calling in the Messiah, Yeshua. So blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth, that everlasting life on our midst, and blessed are thou, O Yehovah, the giver of the Torah. Amen. Shake off the spirit of time on you right now. <coughs> promise you it won't be late. I promise you. Philippians chapter 3, 14 says that we are to continue to pursue the prize. The prize. What is the prize? Today I want to talk about the prize. We felt the prize. We, we, we seen the prize move in this place this morning. You know, you can have all your doctrines right, yet still not have the presence of Yehovah. Your house can be perfect, your marriage can be perfect, your children can be perfect, but yet not the presence. You know, the presence of Yehovah in revival is absolutely everything. <clears throat> and without the presence, there is no purpose. I need you to get that because if we don't have the presence in here, there's no purpose of coming. The purpose of coming is not to hear something because you can hear anything, anytime. The purpose of here is not just to come and praise him because you can praise him anywhere. We, ha we live in a, a, a place of access that you don't even have to leave your room. You can hear every sermon you want to hear. You can hear every praise song you want to hear, right? You don't have to do nothing. So it's not about just being here. It's about the presence. We need a people who yearn for Yehovah's manifest presence more than anything. More than anything that you have. That's what you want, his presence. Because what we need to understand is that everything, everyone say everything, everything <clears throat> flows out of Yehovah's presence. I like the Torah portion, the portion that we pulled out from, because what he's basically said is, where you go, you're going into a land that is not a land that used to worship me and a people that didn't worship me. So you find every place where they worshiped someone that was not me, and you tear them down, whether it's on high, whether it's on low, whether it's even underneath a leafy tree, you get rid of it. And then he said, you are to worship me. Then he talks about what you are to bring to him. And then he says, you are to be there where he is. You are to eat it and enjoy it in the presence of Yehovah. One of the greatest things in the book of Genesis is that they walked with him in the cool of the day. He wasn't someone who created them and walked away. He was someone who created them and walked with them. Aren't you glad that God didn't save you and then sits high on the throne all by himself, but that he loves you enough to walk with you? So we need that presence, that presence to sustain an environment. We need that presence to sustain this culture, this lifestyle of revival that we are asking for. We must be wholly, completely dependent upon Yehovah. We have been dependent upon our money, our jobs, our wisdom, our own knowledge, our own abilities, our own talents too long. <clears throat> we have depended upon our mates, our children, and our, our grandchildren for all that stability. Remember I said that you have to really allow God to be the one that sustains you, even though other things can sustain you in a very natural, temporal way. But if you don't have God sustain you, it's in trouble. Because as soon as one of those falter, it makes your ground very shaky. So Yehovah and his presence <clears throat> are not two different separate entities. They are the same. And we have to understand that if we want the prize, the prize of the Spirit of God, the prize of the presence, the prize of His glory, <clears throat> that revival is not a matter of me preaching harder. Because I can. It's not a matter of praying harder because we can. You can have someone at the altar cracking the whip, harder, <laughs> louder. It's not that we can sing harder because we can. Revival is not a matter of trying harder because trying harder, if that was the case, man, some of us would be experiencing the presence of God in a great and mighty way. 
But revival is a matter of Yehovah coming in power and visitation. We can't force Yehovah's hand to gain an objective. And I want you to understand that. <clears throat> we think sometimes we can come in and just, you know, bully him. Look a certain way and we will move him. Say a certain thing and we will change him. Right? Right? Because we want an objective, and this is what we want. And we want to have that, so we want to gain this objective. We want to kind of force God's hand. But it's really about flowing with the movement of the Spirit to experience heaven's objective. What did God want to do today? What does God still want to do today? Not what I have come to gain, but what have I come to see? What do you want? Which way you want to go? Which direction do you want to go? You know, that's somewhat freeing. To say, I'm here, and whatever God wants, I'm going to do it. But you have to be willing to posture yourself so that when he flows, you will flow with it. You won't get nervous about it. You won't get upset about it. You won't look at your time. You won't look at your phone. You won't do anything else. You're just saying, listen, God, whatever your objective is, I am here because this is your day, so you do what you want. And if we're here to nine, and we won't be, that I know of, It's his objective. There's nothing worse than having something set up and you, you have an objective for somebody and they're coming to you and you want to take them here and there and they want to change that objective. They want to change your plans, right? You set up this, you set up that, you're excited about what you set up and here and there, you bring them and they say, no, I don't want that, I don't want to do that. What you want to say is open the car door and just jump out because I, I, this is where I'm going. What, what is heaven's objective? You know, the great prize of revival is the sense of Jehovah's presence that it's so close, <clears throat> so heavy among us, that it's almost tangible, but also glorious. Something that we can touch, but almost don't want to touch. And when we, as a kind of a frail humanity, because, you, you know, we are frail, right? Our feelings can be hurt in a moment. We can, you know, on Wednesday night, I think it was Wednesday night, I went out and we were looking at something and I tripped over the, the plant. In a moment, you could fall, break something, right? As strong as you think you are. This frail humanity <clears throat> collides with this powerful presence of Jehovah. I just think that's so awesome that he will come in the midst of this frailty, this humanity, and our weakness. And something happens, joy, tears, laughter, shouting, singing, weeping, <clears throat> falling. Whether you've experienced any of those things, there are things that you can experience. Your body responds differently to the presence of God. Don't be nervous. Don't be afraid. That's just how it is. The great joy of revival is when the Ruach is so preeminent among us that conviction seizes the loss and then draws us to Yeshua. We need Yehovah's presence, not as some spiritual side item. You go to Longhorn or wherever you go, you can tell I like a Longhorn. <clears throat> they want to know if you want an appetizer. Appetizer is just to prepare you for the meal. It's side dishes. You're more concerned about the main meal than the side dish, right? <clears throat> You're thinking, you don't go there thinking, I wonder what side dishes I'm going to get. You go there thinking, I wonder what I'm going to get. And then when they say, what side dishes? And you say, oh, let me see. Because if there's anything you're going to leave on your plate, <laughs> it's going to be that broccoli, even though now I like the broccoli at Longhorn. But you're focusing on the main event. And so this presence is not some spiritual side dish, but is the central focus of all we do in life and ministry. <clears throat> when you get up tomorrow morning, your focus should be him. Throughout the day, it should be him. In your relationship, it should be him. Central focus. Listen, we cannot predict, we cannot work out or manufacture revival. But when he moves, things change absolutely overnight. 
On Acts chapter 2, they went in, though it was 10 days, they went in praying and seeking the Lord. They were people who ran away. They were people who denied. They were people who were confused. They were people who were fearful. And when they came out, you couldn't stop them. I said when they came out, because prayer changed things. Revival changed things. And it wasn't just the prayer. It was the prayer that pulled the presence of God into their atmosphere and collided with their frail humanity. That's what's powerful about it. God's not waiting for us to be perfect. He's waiting for us just to be available. Our solution. How many want a solution? Our solution to our problems. Write this down. I tell you enough times what the problem is. I'm giving you a solution. Our solution to our problems is one moment in Jehovah's presence. Just, just one moment. If you're driving a car, it takes one moment to run off the road. Right? It takes one moment to make a bad decision. But one moment in his presence, just one moment can can cause cancer to go, can cause diabetes to change around, can cause confusion to be removed, can cause addiction to be lifted. One, just, just one moment, just one moment. If all you tell God, God, I just need one moment, I just need one moment of, not your time, but one moment of your cloud, one moment of your fire, one moment that's going to refine me, that's going to that's gonna change me, that's going to shift me, I need one moment. Jehovah's glory releases supernatural transformation in just one moment. The blind man, do you want to be healed? I do want to be healed. Do you believe I can heal you? I believe. Then see, one moment, one moment, one three-minute conversation with a woman caught in adultery with a whole bunch of Pharisees and Sadducees. One moment, she walks away a free woman. She walks away not only a free woman, but a changed woman, a disciple woman, a woman filled with power that's going to serve Yeshua for the rest of her life. One moment, say one moment. Just one moment. That's all I need. One moment will bring you freedom. One moment will bring you guidance. One moment will bring you clarity. One moment will bring you direction. One moment will bring you peace, will bring you love, will bring you a sense of identity. One moment will bring you joy. One moment will bring you healing. One moment will bring you deliverance. Hallelujah. One moment. Just give me one moment. How many know we need a revival? We need a revival of Jehovah's presence. We don't need a revival of <clears throat> increase of people. That would be nice. We don't need a revival of increase in other things. That, that would be nice. But we need his presence, right? Listen, 3,000 people could usher itself in here and just would be 3,000 more problems <laughs> without his presence. I'm not saying <clears throat> don't bring him in. I'm just saying, could you check him at the door? No, I'm just saying. <laughs> We need Yehoah to step down from heaven. Come, act, speak. We need his holy presence, his word on fire. Because if that happens, it won't be confined to here. If you think the purpose of revival is just for here, you misunderstand. Look at John 16, 7. Look what it says. I tell you the truth. I like it when Yeshua starts telling you the truth. As he's going to tell you something that's not. I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Now, at that moment, you don't understand why would that be an advantage? Because you have lived with him for a couple years now. But it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I don't go away, The comforting counselor will not come to you. However, if I do go, I will send him to you. The Yeshua could only be in one place at one time. But the spirit can be absolutely everywhere. 
I'm glad when we come here as a corporate body, he's in the midst, but I'm also thankful <clears throat> that he can be here, and if I was in Africa, he can be in Africa. And if I was in Europe, he would be in Europe. And if I was on a mountain, he would be on the mountain. If I was in a valley, he'd be in the valley. Whatever I'm going through, whatever you're going through, though he is here when we're together, I am so thankful he can divide himself but still yet be whole. Yeshua could directly touch only these who heard him and saw him. But the Spirit could directly touch people anywhere at any time, whether they're sitting in this house or they're not sitting in this house. In revival, <clears throat> the Spirit moves deeply and wide. You know that deep and wide, deep and wide, what? There's a fountain flowing. Then you have to hum it. Because he can supernaturally and powerfully go into your homes. He can go into the schools. He can go into the businesses. He can go into the places where sin is happening. And he brings this sense of reality of Yehovah. He brings conviction. You know, it's impossible, and I thank him for it, to flee from Yehovah <clears throat> at all, but especially during revival. When his presence shows up, you can't run nowhere. The words of Jeremiah, let me read. We, we read them. I'll read them really quickly. Am I God only when near, says Adonai, and not when far away? Can anyone hide in a place so secret that I won't see him? Ask Adonai. Adonai says, do I not fill the earth and heaven or the heaven and the earth? In Psalms 139, 7 through 12 says, where can I go to escape your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I climb up to heaven, you are there. If I lie down in Sheol, you are there. If I fly away with the wings of the dawn and land be, uh, <clears throat> beyond the sea, even there your hand would lead me. Your right hand would hold me fast. If I say, let darkness surround me, let the light around me be night, even darkness like this is not too dark for you. <clears throat> Rather, night is as clear as day. And darkness and light are the same. So when revival hits, <clears throat> this, this word in Jeremiah and Psalms is for every day, but when revival hits, it intensifies. You know, during different revivals, I want to encourage you to go search. If you like to search, you know, we're searching a lot of things about what's happening and all that, <clears throat> and that's, you know, sometimes a downer. What you need to do is go and search about some revivals. You know, during the Welch revival, just to, I'm not doing a lot, but during the Welch revival, as I looked it up, <clears throat> men used to go to bars and drink because they didn't want to go home because their wives were praying. And the presence of Yehoah was there. So <clears throat> they were there in the bar, and as they took their drink in their hands, now this is testimony. An unseen hand would stop them, and they would run home and get saved. Come on. Now, I think you think that's made up, but this is what God can do. <clears throat> Visitors asked how to get to the meetings when they would fly in, and they were told, just feel it. All you had to do is feel it. And another move, revival broke out on a battleship, the battleship of North Carolina. Maybe some of you military people can look at it. <clears throat> and uh, four Christian men who had meetings in the, in the bow of the ship for and ungodly shipmates would come down and mock them. And when they came down and mocked them, they were gripped by the power of God. And they began to cry and repent. And it got so intense that the, the leadership had to send <clears throat> ashore for mem members or ministers to help, and the battleship now became what they would call a Bethel, a house of God. Because where you pray, things change. There's a man that was praying for his unsaved friend for years, and one day the friend came to borrow a tool, but no one was there. But because he's a friend, he knew how to get in, and he went to the tool shed. And when he went into the tool shed, <clears throat> the presence of God overtook him, and he put his faith in Yeshua all by himself. And when he told his friend, his friend said, that shed is where I prayed for you every single day that God would bring to, you, to himself. 
he created a place of presence. <clears throat> where he ate, the presence was. And then when someone comes into that place of presence, listen, just go and read about their revivals because it will stir your faith. So the question for us is, where is Jehovah's presence today? Now, again, that's not a negative thing because <clears throat> we know that we have moments and we have pockets and we have times, <clears throat> we have movements. We, we understand what the presence of God is all about. We've been there under some weighty presence and where he's moved in great and mighty ways, both here and abroad. There are those consistently releasing very powerful things. And even today, you know, you can, <clears throat> you can see very powerful worship songs coming out, some powerful worship songs that we even sing. But the problem is, and unfortunately, is that what happens is when those things are birthed, they become something that is for entertainment, not for divine presence. It might have been birthed for it, but then it changes and shifts. We all know about that because sometimes our agenda and our structure hinders the presence of Jehovah. Sometimes <clears throat> things are more important than the Spirit's agenda because we have embraced the culture and we have embraced the busyness of an American life. If anything that we can learn from this pandemic, this situation, this challenge, this <clears throat> whatever you want to call it, is who is first in your life and that everything can be stopped in a heartbeat and you're going to need someone who's able to sustain you. So we schedule <clears throat> not giving room for Yehovah. Now, I'm not saying that having a plan is wrong or an order of service is wrong. I'm not that type of people where you just come and sit and wait to see what God's going to do. But we have to understand that even within the order, we know that we're going to come in. We know that we're going to pray. We know that praise and worship is going to go forth. We know there's a time when we give. We know there's a time when we preach. That's an order, and that's good. You need to have an order. You don't want to look at me and I'm saying, I don't know yet. You'd be like, well, come on, tell me. So, I don't know. That's good to have an order, but here's the thing. <clears throat> Though we have a genuine desire for Yehovah to move, because I guarantee that every single one of you want Yehovah to move, sometimes we prevent the spontaneous flow of the Spirit because of our order, because of our agenda and because of our structure. So we have a lot to consider. We must make room. Turn to someone and say, make room for him. You all know what it is to be in a cluttered room. <clears throat> can't walk, can't move, can't do nothing. You know what it is to be in a, a small car for a long period of time. The first five minutes is okay. You're like, this is going to be a good trip. And then 30 minutes, and I need to get out. Everybody's fighting for the front seat. Are you okay back there? Yeah. Even the most kindest, nicest person, I'll get in the back. I have no problem. After a while, you just, oh, you, oh, you just want to, like, beat things up. You want to break windows and <clears throat> strangle people. That's inside. And In the outside, you're like this. But you've got to get out. We have to make room. We've crowded God. And he's trying to move in, and he can't because you're saying, listen, God, I got my agenda. Listen, God, I got to watch my watch. Listen, God, I got some things to do it this afternoon. <laughs> if you can move, can you move within that time? Oh, God, I got to go early. I got to leave early because I got some things I need to do. Can you move within this first thing? Well, if not, then I'll catch you next week. But we need him. I need to make room for him. We have a lot to consider. But we may have also become unwilling to consider allowing Yehovah to move because his activity might just disrupt our lives and our schedules. 
Now, I'm not saying that we have to have a three-hour service. I was waiting for someone saying, oh, no, we could. <laughs> you don't have to, you know, sometimes you say, oh, the longer the service, the better. No, sometimes the long service didn't even produce the, the presence of God. It was just a long service, right? <clears throat> sometimes you get more out of a commercial than you did a, a, a series, right? You're moved by a 30-minute call. And then you a whole certain and you're like, what 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 went on the series? I have no idea. I was just so bored. So I'm not saying that you have to have a three hour long service, and I'm not saying you don't have, have to three hour. I'm not saying any of those things other than our hearts need to be at a place where the prize for us is his presence. To eat with him, to sup with him. May we at Lion of Judah Ministries be marked by a passion and hunger for spirit's visitation and an outpouring. May we not worry about our agenda. Now, God is a loving God, and he's a very powerful God, and we know and he knows that we have to go on and we do some things, and he has the ability to do all those things. But he just wants us to say, no agenda today, God, just you. We have a plan of order. We have a way that we're going. But if any time you want to interrupt and any time you want to change it, we're more than willing to let you do it because we have made room for you. <clears throat> this is your day. If I have an appointment at 2 and then I look and says preacher didn't start to 1, I don't even worry about it. Do you know why? Because I have canceled and changed appointments before. And I can change and cancel appointments for you. I've changed it because I didn't want to go. I changed it because I didn't have the money. I changed it because I didn't feel like it. How many ever changed? You didn't feel like it. You use another excuse. May, for Lion of Judah, that be the defining feature that sets us apart as his kahila. May we be <clears throat> the kahila that makes room and we're marked by passion and hunger and thirst for his presence. You know, contemporary and modern is not our enemy. What, what I mean by that, it's nice to have a projector. It's nice to have some seats that are cushioned. Come on. Some of you don't know what it is because you got saved after the pew. <clears throat> but the pew was hard. Even if they had that, that little cushion that went down the whole pew, someone moved and pushed that. You're like, stop. You didn't have flowing air. You didn't have wonderful heat. When we went to the Ukraine, we went to services where we had to wear our coats. And there's people just sitting there worshiping the Lord, and we're like, this is not shaking of the Holy Ghost. This is shaking because we are so, so cold. Big boots, big clothes, big hats. We come back to America like, oh. Thank God I'm not the Ukraine. So contemporary and modern is not our enemy. But it is our enemy when we assume that all these secondary matters are most important that we run into trouble. So you came in and the air conditioners broke. Well, we can't have service because the secondary matter was more important than the presence. Do you know God can move in air conditioning as well as tropical heat? You know, he doesn't say, it is too hot even for me. <laughs> I am not coming. <laughs> Get it fixed before you see me. Right? He's not coming and saying, listen, I can't walk on concrete. I need some carpet. So these secondary matters, though they are blessings to us. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Oh, I'm not. I Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for cool when it's hot, and thank you, Lord, for heat when it's cold. Thank you, Lord, for a cushion seat. So you can lay at the altar, and it's concrete underneath this thing. You can go there and lay on that right there, and you can have groanings of the Spirit. You can get, these are comfortable. But they're secondary. We use these things. To create an atmosphere, listen, 
for people. But we need to create an atmosphere for Yehovah, for his presence, for his glory. <clears throat> Does God care whether you're comfortable or not? Not really. Is he upset that you're comfortable? <laughs> not really. I don't know if you ever saw way back when I posted that one uh, thing on Facebook where that little, that little, I think it was an Asian church or maybe it was an African church sitting there with floodwaters up to their, almost up to their um, knees, sitting there to worship the Lord. We're not there. <laughs> I'm just saying, that wasn't, an atmosphere wasn't created for people, but it was an atmosphere that could be created for God. Whatever we think of to better our building, whatever we think of to better our service, <clears throat> understand this, that will not change lives. I must encounter the Father. Say it with me. You must encounter the Father. We must encounter the Father. You can't leave and saying, I sat on a really cushiony seat and got healed. Thank God the air was on because when the air came on, my diabetes left me. <laughs> you need him. You need him. We must have his presence in our midst, and that is more important to us than anything else. Everything else will flow from that desire. I want you then everything will flow from that. The worship will flow from that. The preaching will flow from that. Disciples will flow from that. Our outreaches will flow from that. From that one desire, give me one moment in your presence. We have to cultivate a hunger and thirst, right? That word cultivate means what? That you can say, it. what's it mean? to develop, to encourage, to work it, right? <clears throat> we must cultivate a hunger. The more you eat, the more you're hungry. The more you drink water, the more that you want water, right? You have to cultivate it, a hunger, a thirst for the presence of Yehovah. Otherwise, when Yehovah does come in power, we will not welcome him and will not be prepared for our day of visitation. I need a moment. I need just one moment. In closing, Moses said this. This is a real close, not a first close from the three. This is a real close. Thank you. I have a moment with the Holy Spirit. Moses understood this, and this is a powerful verse attached to what I'm saying. I'm going to just turn around and read it for you. Moses replied, if your presence doesn't go with us, don't make us go on from here. Let that sink in from the, from the sermon. If you won't go with us, we don't want to go. That's how important it was for Moses. For how else is it to be known that I have found favor in your sight? I and your people, other than by your going with us. Now look what it says. That is what distinguishes us, me, and your people from all the other peoples on the earth. I got last-minute goosebumps. <clears throat> you understand? If you just, if you were there with Moses and heard him, you would understand, I can't go without you, and I will not go without you. And how else will they distinguish us? Because if we go without you, we are like every Buddy else. And what has God told us? You are chosen. You are royal. Right? You are a remnant. 
You are to show forth the praises, which means you are different. Something about you is different. Not odd. (laughs) Different. And the different is presence. Man, I'm going to read that one more time. Moses replied in his conversation with God, if your presence doesn't go with us, Don't make us go on from here. For how else is it to be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, other than by your going with us? That is what distinguishes us, me and your people, from all the other peoples on the earth. You know what will make Lana Judah different than any other church? presence. You know what's going to make you different than anyone else in your household? Presence. You know what's going to make you different than anyone else in your job? Your presence. D, wouldn't that be great when you go to work, and I'm just saying because I know you work at a facility, that when you walk in, everyone gets healed, and they have to fire you because they have to fire you because you have caused them to lose income. They call you in, D, I'm sorry, but you have to go, why? You're, you do really well, your job, but you just, every time you come in here, people get healed, and then we're losing money. So we have to, we have to let you go. Now we have to let you go. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't you be glad to lose your job over that? <laughs> what? I still need money to survive. I'm just saying, wouldn't it be known that when people go by this house, they pull in. They don't know why they're pulling in, but they're drawn to pull in, and then they come in and just ask Yeshua into their life. We didn't have to do nothing. We didn't have to say nothing. But what we did was create an atmosphere of prayer for his presence because we can't go on. What you should say today before you leave this house, God, I can't go out those doors unless you go with me. I'm not coming back next week just to see you. You've got to go with me because how else will people know that you are in my life? How else will people know and distinguish that I am different unless you go before me? Turn to someone say, one moment. I just need one moment. Let's stand before Yehovah. <clears throat> you need one moment. Glory to Yehovah. Pastor Kenny, I have to create a song with one moment in it. Hasn't God been sweet today? Okay. Five minutes, we'll start the service over again. One moment. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Pastor Kenny's getting ready. Come on, uh, let's move that pulpit and get the young, uh, young children up here. And church, come, and we'll pray over our children while he's singing. <clears throat> Miracles happen when you work. Healing is coming in this room. Miracles happen when you look. Heaven is coming. Miracles happen.
So, Father, we come before you asking, God, for each one of these children represented here and those who are not here, that you will give them one moment. One moment of your presence will change their lives. One moment of your presence will propel them to a place of relationship. Father, we ask for one moment in each and every life that is represented on this prayer show. Change them, shift them, move them, draw them, anoint them, empower them to be men and women. Father of Yehoah, disciples that will follow you, yield their lives to you. You have so many great things ready for them, so many great things for them to do, Father. Lord, guard their lives and plant their feet and guide them and direct them in all areas and all ways. Create a heart that's sensitive to you, a hunger and thirst that will drive them to your word, drive them to your presence. We thank you for their lives. We thank you for what they mean. We thank you for who they are. And we ask for your anointing upon them. In the name above every name, the name of Yeshua, Hamashiach, we pray. When you move, healing is coming in this room. Miracles happen when you move. Heaven is coming. Heaven is coming. Miracles happen when you move. Healing is coming in this room. Miracles happen when. stretch forth your hands for the priestly prayer. Hallelujah. Yehovah, he who exists, now before you presenting gifts, and will guard you with a hedge of protection. Yehovah, he who exists, will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you, bringing order, and he will provide you with love, sustenance, and friendship. And Yehovah, he who exists, will lift up wholeness of being and look upon you, set in place all you need to be, whole and complete. May Yehovah grant all the desires of our hearts, fulfill all our purposes and all our petitions. May Yehovah hear from heaven, quickly answer all our requests. Save us in the day of adversity. And in the name of Yeshua, the Messiah, defend us from our enemies, from poverty, and from bondage. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. See you in the fellowship hall. One moment. Oh. Is the brown blanket over there? Is that the br a brown? Can you get the brown blanket that's over there? Give it to Pastor Kenny. A brown blanket over there in the corner. Oh, it's here. 
Oh, plus Kenny needs the first piano. Uh, you can leave that there. He just needs his brown blanket. His piano gets really upset if it's not fucked up. <laughs> 